Thank you for having me. This is a wonderful experience to be here. I'm so happy to be sharing whatever it is that I know in my head with all of you uh, in terms of my experience uh, in the US and working with US companies. Um, also having a little bit of experience uh, in India. I was here last year, actually. This is my first time in Mumbai. Uh, but I was here last year in Hyderabad uh, and in Delhi. So I have a little bit of, of knowledge uh, about what goes on here. And when I was at Deloitte, I had um, a fairly large team in reporting and analytics uh, sitting in Hyderabad. Um, so the, it's, it's moving, right? We're progressing in this field. But I started way back when, in the 90s, as a consultant. Uh, of course, we know how all great people, analytic people start, as a consultant. Um, at the time, we actually called it HR measurement. So the word analytics was not there, right? I'm sure it was there somewhere, but it wasn't in HR. Right? So we called ourselves the measurement experts. Um, and what did that mean? At the time, it was surveys. Right? So that's what I did. I did survey analysis. I did a lot of structured data analysis. And then I didn't want to get stuck behind a desk. I didn't want to get stuck behind a computer. So I moved into unstructured data analysis through interviews and focus groups. Uh, and, and that actually helped me get out right, and understand what it was like in the business, understanding what it was like for business professionals. Because you really do need to do that as a consultant. It's really tough, I think, to be a career consultant without really understanding uh, what goes on in industry, what goes on in the business. Um, and this definitely makes you a better leader and also a better people analytics expert. Um, so over time, I, I did go into the business, did sales and marketing. At all during this time, of course, HR was evolving. Uh, HR analytics was evolving. So I wanted to share my view on how it has evolved. So what's old HR versus new HR? We, we always, at the time that I was in, and I think we still do, uh, when I was a consultant, talk about best practices, right? Everybody has probably uttered the words best practices as an HR professional. And I think we still, of course, look to best practices. Uh, but, but what does that mean? Uh, do we actually measure these best practices? How do we know that they're best practices? Just because it worked for our competitors doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for us, right? So we need to be using data to make these decisions. Um, that's why I went into this field. I feel very confident making decisions when it's based on data. Uh, I don't feel confident making decisions necessarily based on best practices. Uh, so that's, I think, one of the trends in HR is obviously integrating, I'm going to say this so many times, this is the one word that you'll take away from this session, is integrating data right, to make decisions. And that's really what people analytics is. I'm so bad at this. Okay. So HR, is, of course, right, we've delivered in the past in these functional silos. So recruiting, um, obviously, we've you know, recruiting talent acquisition is what we say now. Uh, and uh, we've evolved into more of an integrated approach. Um, instead of these functional silos in HR, I think we're really working together. And I'm at AIG, you know, as mentioned. I was at Deloitte previously. I think in, in what we call talent at Deloitte instead of HR, we really worked uh, as an integrated body of HR. So rather than in these silos, right, and in these HR groups, we really are understanding all of the, the data coming from all of the groups, integrating that to make better decisions. But we need to take that a step further, right, and use more data from the organization. So we'll talk more about that. And I think my job here today is to, to really set up the, the broad context for which all of the rest of our distinguished speakers will then kind of unpack, right, and get really practical and detailed. Uh, so forgive me if I'm not going deep into these concepts. I think you'll continue to hear it throughout the day. So this is another theme, of course, and this is what I struggle with right now at AIG. We do so much manual work, right? Um, where are we moving? We're moving into automation. We're moving into AI. We're moving into machine learning. Um, of course, uh, at AIG, and I'm, I'm sure at all of your organizations, we do a lot. We're trying to push a lot into self-service. Right? So we have Workday. We're trying to get our people to actually use Workday themselves, right? instead of the reporting team having to pull all the data for them. We're saying, actually, you can do this yourself. It's really easy. Here's a, you know, a little job tip or, or a little tip sheet uh, in order to do so. That's very difficult, right? And we have a lot of resistance. I think people have had an inconsistent experience with HR over time. Uh, we have you know, the, the timing, number one, to get answers to questions from HR shared services. At one point, it was really people-driven. And now it's actually, it can be AI-driven, 
chatbots, right, number one, that, that is actually contributing to a much more consistent experience from the employee perspective, but also from a candidate perspective, right, through the recruiting experience, people can have a much better experience if we have some more automation, consistency through AI, and reducing human bias, of course, which I know Dr. Abishad has talked about as well. So we also, this is, these are the big concepts here coming up, that's why I saved them for last. We have been traditionally a service provider, right, to the rest of the organization, right? Uh, we are a cost center, let's call ourselves. However, where are we moving? We need to move, if we haven't already, to a trusted business advisor. We have to be a partner with the business. Uh, I have always felt like I am a service provider as an HR professional, and we really need to move into this mindset of being a partner because we do drive business results as HR. So cost center to value creator. I have heard so many people at these people analytics conferences over time talk about HR as a value creator. People create value. Right, we're moving more and more to a service-driven economy. Uh, we need people to drive this. Right? We, we have to talk about productivity, and I think that's the number one way we can contribute is, is people productivity versus products. Obviously, products are always going to be created, but we really are driving this economy through people and productivity and services. And please ask questions throughout if you have a disagreement. I love it. I'd love to hear uh, if your perspective is different. Uh, speak up whenever. So we have a lot of data sources. Here's a list of them. There's more than what's on here. Uh, we have more and more data at our fingertips, right? How are we looking at all this data? How are we putting it together? Are we putting it together in a data warehouse? A lot of us are trying to do that, right? Uh, we have some of our data in one system, some of it in another. There's probably at least six to eight systems that we have this data sitting in right now. Uh, we have, obviously, performance management. Recruiting has so much data right at AIG right now. We are trying to wrangle our recruiting data to make decisions. That is the key. I think there's a big market. I don't know, uh, you know the last time you all went to a conference, and I don't know what vendors are out here, but when I've seen vendors at uh, conferences in the US, almost every single one of them, probably 80%, has a recruiting tool because there is so much cool data out there that we could be harnessing to attract and retain, obviously, but recruit better candidates uh, and select, right? Get a better slate, number one. Uh, and then how are we selecting? How are we making the right decision? Um, there's a lot of, of AI, right? There's a lot of cool techniques that we can be using in the recruiting space that I think we're just starting to take advantage of. But after that, right, how do we harness that data and, and, and integrate it, there's my word again, with all the other data that we have? Job mobility is another huge one. Uh, down at the bottom right, I mean, th this is data that we have a really hard time tracking. So what is a transfer? What does that mean? Um, does it mean that someone is improving? Does it mean that they're high potential if they're moving? In these things, we need to label as such in order to make decisions based on that. So this is another thing that I'm really focusing on at AIG, is really understanding what our data means, and let's label it differently. Let's flag it differently. Let's put it into Workday differently so I can pull it out. Right, and look at it alongside all of my other data and make decisions about those segments of people. <coughs> so what is people analytics? You know, we just heard about some of the semantics. Uh, we've heard workforce analytics, we've heard HR analytics, we've heard talent analytics. And we've, pr we've probably landed on people analytics, at least in the US. Uh, and I think that's because we really are bringing all of the people data together. It's probably not just HR data, right? It's people data, and we're also broadening that to all data. But even sales data is really people data, right? It's what people are generating. Uh, so we want to be as broad as possible when we're talking about this, this field, right? And so I think people analytics really encompasses that more so than HR analytics. HR analytics, to me, uh, I, I think, OK, well, I'm measuring the effectiveness of HR programs. Right, but we're not just doing that here. Right? We're really combining and integrating the data in a broader sense. So we also, uh, we also think that PA, which is what we call it at, at AIG, is a team sport. Right? We have so many disciplines that come together to create this team. Um, so it, it stems from right, behavioral sciences like psychology. Um, so we have some IO psychologists, industrial organizational psychologists on our team. Um, obviously, we have some data scientists. 
Um, we also have people who were just our, our plain old reporting people, right, and, and analytics people. But we've really come together uh, to create this team. It, it can't just be one type of person. Uh, we also have, of course, people who are more of the kind of MBA type consultants because they're the ones who can tell the story to the business. Right? We need so many different levels and facets and disciplines of people coming together in this team uh, that it's actually uh, uh, something new and exciting. I don't think that there is, the, or in any other part of HR, I'm not sure that, that this many disciplines exist on a team. And we're still trying to figure it out, right? which is why we're here. Um, and one of the big things is, I don't know if you noticed this, this web here. This is the, the network analysis web, right? I think this is kind of the logo for network analysis, which was one of the big trends in people analytics. Um, I think right now the trend is AI. It was ONA, organizational network analysis, right? Um, before that, I think it was NLP. Now, I love all these acronyms. Natural language processing. Um, and, and I think even before that, when I first started, uh, it was predictive, right? Predictive, and it still is, right, is the holy grail, right? We all want to get there. Uh, but these are the, the kind of fads and the trends that uh, I've seen throughout the last few years, and they, you know, they all still live on, right? We still want to get there. Uh, but AI, I think, is the one that's, that everyone's talking about now. The, the amount of times I've heard AI, uh, I would be rich, right, if I had a nickel for every time. All right, so what is people analytics about? Uh, so I've danced around it, uh, but we really want to use data to increase our you know, reliability um, uh, about decisions, right? We don't want to use gut instinct or what we've done before traditionally. Um, we want to be able to trust that our decisions are made using sound information, right? And that's, that's data-based. The other big idea is, you know, what comes first? Uh, is it people? Of course, right? As HR, we want people to come first. But in people analytics, the business comes first. Right? We need to integrate, I love that word, we need to align, we need to combine, uh, we need to support the business objectives, right? We, we need to be those partners for the business, in people analytics especially. So this is a vision statement that actually we have for our team at AIG. Uh, we wanna get people uh, analytics to enable access to the right information uh, to the right people, right, not just anybody, uh, at the right time, so that would be real time, right? We don't wanna give them data from 12 to 18 months ago, we wanna give them real time data that they can make decisions on now. Um, and of course, they need facts, right, in order to make those decisions. Do you all agree with this? <coughs> all right, good, I'm glad, okay, because I needed, I needed some, <laughs> uh, some agreement for the vision of my group. So is people analytics aligned to people strategy? This is a test. Is people analytics aligned to people strategy? No. It's aligned to business strategy. This is my test for you guys. <laughs> so we're aligned to business strategy. We need to, to understand uh, what is the business doing? And we can't do this in isolation. Otherwise, they're not going to use our data. Right? They're, not gonna, they're, just, they're just not even going to look at it. Uh, so, I'm sure you've seen 100 million of these types of charts before, the levels, you know, and I have another one to share next about people analytics, kind of the maturity models, right? Uh, so level one would be, we're, you know, we're compliance driven, we're really, uh, you know, it's a, it's a function that's really just doing transactions, right? So there's the transactional to the transformational. So level one is really that basic level uh, of transactions. Uh, then we are continuing to move uh, to really sharing across HR. So first is in silos, now we're integrating more with the other HR groups, um, really understanding and being, you know, becoming more strategic. Uh, and we're aligning more and more with the business strategy. So instead of operating in, in an HR silo, right, we're starting to listen more to the business and really supporting that business. I mean, it just gets more and more into this integrated feeling of, of, of being a partner to HR and a value creator, sorry, a, a partner to the business and a value creator to the business. But that's the, the main concept here without all these, these little words that you can barely read. So here is the analytics maturity model. This is taken from PwC. There's a whole bunch of them out there. Josh Burson from Deloitte, of course, has his own, which is actually much more simple than this. Um, and his really goes from operational to predictive. Uh, this one here is showing us Really, what are we doing in terms of the activities in people analytics? 
So level zero actually is you know, just basic counting, uh, which we all really should be at right, at this stage. We should all be able to count our people, um, count what they do, uh, and you know, count how, how many people come in and how many people transfer and how many people leave. Right? There's just a couple of basic things that we can count. But how do we move on from that? We move on from that by creating, let's say, dashboards. Right? We start to use Power BI, we start to use Tableau, uh, we start to use a, a lot of other tools out there, some of them I'll mention uh, in a little bit. Uh, but I, I think it's really using that data and combining it, but looking at it in a visual way that's going to help me really quickly get a sense of the insight, right? R what does this mean? So creating some type of visual, uh, I think, is that next step. But then as we move on, we really start to compare. Uh, we start to compare to benchmarks. We start to compare externally. How are we doing at our company and compared to you know, my other, the other insurance company down the street? Uh, but also comparing internally, comparing groups, comparing employee segments, comparing businesses, uh, and obviously combining that data as well. Advanced analytics, you know, then we're getting into this predictive, what John, Josh Burson would say is kind of the holy grail, at least back in, you know, a couple of years ago on his model, uh, where we're actually uh, scenario planning, forecasting, right? Um, pulling levers to see, you know, what if we do this, what happens? Uh, you know, we did this at Deloitte, we, had a, we have done a ton of studies at Deloitte. Deloitte is a great guinea pig for doing experiments because there's just so many people and they want to be able to sell this right in the market. So they allowed talent or HR to do anything, right? So they could then say, okay, if this works, then we're gonna go sell it in the market. Uh, so we did things like in performance management, we would look at uh, how many times did people check in with their manager? Um, what is their level of engagement, right, according to engagement surveys? And then, of course, how are they measured in terms of uh, their performance on, on performance evaluations? And then how do we combine all these things to, to create a big picture of a person? Um, and like I, I said yesterday to some of the students, uh, we, you know, we really didn't combine people into one number. Uh, we've moved away from that at Deloitte to looking at people si and all their metrics side by side to understand how people are uh, so I use the analogy of a, a, a lab report that you get from your doctor on your health, right, and, and your blood and all of the, this kind of workup, you call it. Um, you don't get boiled down to a number of, you know, how healthy are you? Okay, I'm 80% healthy, I'm 90% healthy. Um, you really see all of these metrics side by side about yourself, and that's how you evaluate. So that's what we tried to do at Deloitte, is really look at metrics side by side, not boiling you down to a one through five rating, um, because it's just not fair and it's not accurate. Um, there's so much bias, right, inherent in that. So really using all of these things side by side helps to mitigate a lot of that bias. Uh, so what we did and what we found was actually a, a lot of cool stuff, one being that the number of check-ins that you do with your manager, so this is like a, a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly conversation that you would have a touch point, right, with your manager. But as those go up, your engagement goes up, as does your performance. So at, with that knowledge, right, we knock on the door of the business and say, this is what you need to do, right? This is what you need to encourage, this is what you need to push. We did get some resistance from people who said, I don't really wanna talk to my manager once a week, that's too much. Well, you know what, as a leader, you need to talk to your people once a week, depending, right? Some people have jobs that are so cyclical that maybe they don't need to talk to their manager all that often. But typically, if you are aligned on a weekly basis with your priorities and your employees' priorities, uh, and you are both kind of you know, on the same path towards the same goals, um, you will be successful, right? But you, you need to align on that on a regular basis. Otherwise, people start to veer off this way or veer off that way, right? The priorities start to shift. You need to keep on this. And this is what we did at Deloitte, and that was through data over time. Yeah? How do you really measure how many times a person is talking to their manager? Yes, uh, it's really difficult. So we, at, we would ask them. So we literally would send an email bi-weekly and ask them, and then it would send them to you know, a type of survey, ask them did they talk to their manager in this particular time period. So it was literally counting. Uh, in other organizations or other systems, you actually would do your check-in online, right? So you would answer a question that I met with my manager before I even met, or I'm meeting with my manager, uh, how am I feeling in terms of uh, have I used my strengths this week? You would, you would get a little bit of a, an engagement assessment before you would even meet with your manager. Uh, that's in a program called Standout that Marcus Buckingham sells. Uh, he's that strengths-based guru, right, talking about what strengthens you versus what weakens you. 
Um, so we do counting, right? And it's all through email. So these are the things that, that people analytics, um, and at Deloitte it was set up very differently than it is at AIG. AIG is very centralized. Uh, where all of the reporting and advanced analytics, everybody is under one umbrella. At Deloitte, it was separate. It was, uh, we had a strategic analytics group that really looked at finance data and compared that with people data. Uh, we also had an advanced analytics group which was looking at long-term data science heavy uh, drivers of success data. Uh, we had a performance analytics group which really looked at all this type of performance data and counting things and understanding what is engaging people and what is uh, what is driving their performance, but in a different way from the data science models. Uh, and then, of course, we have our traditional reporting and analytics group, which does uh, obviously all reporting, but employee surveys and measuring learning right, and, and development. Um, so all, all of those things were very separate and decentralized uh, at Deloitte, but at AIG, it's all under one umbrella. Um, there's you know, pros and cons to both of these models, and I know a lot of the other speakers will go into this. Uh, but at, at Deloitte, the drivers of success uh, is a huge, uh, I would say, piece of business, right? And, and they want to publish on it, and so it's, it's something that is heavily invested in, also partnering with academics as part of uh, Deloitte's, uh, at least they're motivated to do so because then they will be able to be published. Uh, but it, you know, the things that we found that were, uh, that were really interesting besides the fact that we can correlate check-ins, right, with performance and engagement, uh, were things like, who is successful at Deloitte, right? And before you define who is successful, you have to define success, right? What is successful? And that is the hardest part, right, to define success because are your measures actually accurate? Um, so we, I, you know, I could go into how we've done that, but there are, are multiple ways, right? You don't just boil someone down to a number, but you look at multiple things in order to define success. Uh, but things that we found, and for example, and I know we were talking about this with some of the speakers last night, uh, are people who come into the organization from a campus hire versus an experienced hire. How successful are they? And very, very dis, uh, distinguished, right, we see the difference. So we saw that people who came in as experienced hires were less successful. Who would have thought, right? That would not have been my hypothesis. The campus hires were the more successful ones. Why is that? So we started looking at all of the ways that they've experienced their onboarding. Uh, the way that they've experienced the onboarding was so different. Experienced hires, we thought, they're fine, right? They, they've been there, done that, they know, they know how to network in an organization. We really didn't support them at all. Whereas campus hires, we coddled them, we gave them on a, on a spoon, right? Fed them everything that they needed. And they had networks built in, and they had friends, and they had people in their, you know, in their cohorts. They had a ton of resources and activity, all centered around kind of this class, right? Again, whereas experienced hires, we just kind of let them do their own thing. That did not work. Uh, but we didn't know. We actually did not hypothesize that that would be one of these huge drivers of success at Deloitte. It's literally if you're hired off of a campus, right? That was one of the drivers. Um, obviously, there was a lot more, but that was something that was so surprising to us. And so as a result, what do you do with this data, right? What is people analytics supposed to do? We need to talk to the business about how they are onboarding their people. Uh, it's not just the job of HR, right? How are you on the job onboarding these people? How are you connecting them with, with people they can rely on for advice? How are you networking and, and, and helping these people succeed? Um, so that was something that, as a people analytics expert, you really, or a people analytics anything, right? you really have to understand how to talk to the business and how to get them to take action, right? Because data without action is useless. We have to take action. So the other part of this is, is where are we, right? How many, how many people, at least in the US, or how many companies are, are in these buckets? You know, the majority are not in this advanced analytics space, I would say. I mean, people dabble in it, right? But are you fully there? It's hard. It, it's hard to fully get there. Because everybody's, like I said earlier, everybody's data is in, in multiple systems, right? So you really need to get a data warehouse which is a really tough thing to do, and it takes a long time, and you need people, manpower, resources to, to do that. But you can still do analytics without it. You can do a lot of great stuff without a data warehouse. I don't have one at AIG, and we're still doing great work. Working on that on the side, right? That's a side project. Uh, but there's still a lot you can do. Even stage one, where you're really just doing dashboarding, that's a huge win, right? If you're, if you're not there yet, that's where you should be. 
Um, and then obviously if you're already there, then you expand into doing some more advanced comparative analysis and segmenting your populations and making decisions based on those segments. I'm not gonna go over that because it's too small. I'm gonna move on. So I wanted to share some examples of really easy analyses you can do uh, if you haven't already done them. So how do, you, how do you understand what makes a successful sales professional? And all you really need to do is look at this data alongside other data. So it might be, if you have engagement data, look at the engagement data. Are successful sales professionals more engaged than less successful sales professionals? I'm showing a visual that, that's you know, kind of rudimentary, uh, but shows that they are. If you look at the lines, uh, the lines are engagement and the shapes are sales, right? So in this particular example, we see that the, the highest level of engagement, that line, is correlating with the highest level of sales. Right? And this may or may not be true in your organization, but of course it depends on how you define engagement. Right? There are, are a number of ways to define it. There are a number of questions that go into these engagement indices. They're all very similar. Uh, but it's good to do some research, right, before you define what engagement means to your organization. How do you know which is moving that way? How do you know which what? What is impacting that Yes, but so you don't, right? So this is correlation, so right? So it's not causal. So you really have to do a regression analysis and you have to bring in a lot of other variables to decide if this is actually true. We know that it's correlative, but we don't know what's causing it, right? But we know that this is a good thing and it's going to get us somewhere, right? Okay, so we don't want people to be to have low engagement because actually that's correlating with lower sales. What else do we need? We have to dig deeper, right? But at least you can share this with your with your business, right? And because a lot of a lot of businesses really don't believe that employee engagement is important. A lot of business leaders think I don't care, right? If they, if they can sell, great. That's all I really care about, right? But you know what? There's a lot more that goes into a well-rounded person who's going to stay with you, who's going to put that level of discretionary effort right into their job, um, and they're going to go the extra mile for you, uh, and, and that's probably linked to their engagement levels. So another example, manager effect. We're actually doing this today, AG. Manager effectiveness. So what do you look at when you look at manager effectiveness? Upward feedback or 360s, right? You all have something like that, right? That measures the effectiveness of your managers or your leaders. So if we look at that, and then we also look at their evaluations from their from their managers, right? So upward and downward, uh, and we can lump them into categories. Really simple. Are they high, medium, or low, right? So if we look at our high performers, um, what are they doing, right? Are, what are they doing well? Uh, these are the high the high category are the people who are our future leaders. So we've segmented that population. What are we going to do about them? Right? How are we going to treat them differently? And how are we going to get maybe the average performers to move up? I don't know what we can do to remediate the low performers. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> but I think we really do have an opportunity here with the, the high and the medium to bring them into uh, the leadership roles that we have in you know, the pipeline. Uh, and do we, you know, what skills do they have? What skills are they lacking? Then let's change our learning and development right, around what we need for, for these leaders. So another example for, for this particular business priority is, is you know, building high-performing leaders, but also a diverse <coughs> culture. So you can use that same data and look at all managers' um, upward feedback ratings. So we look at males and we look at females. We see males in this particular case, this is dummy data, by the way, this is not real data, but in this particular case, I'm making a point, um, we have males rated higher. And then if we look at female managers rating males and females. We see here that females actually are, are higher, right, than, than the average when we look at all managers rating them. Um, but males are still up there. So how, you know, what's happening? We need to dig even deeper. Let's compare. Okay, male managers are rating fem female managers very low. We have a problem here, right? And so what are we going to do about this? I don't know. But we need to do something about it, right? And this is the kind of information that we need to uncover and share uh, because what is going on, right? And why is this happening? Yes? Just wanted to understand, how do you identify these areas? So for example, I understand that business priority is high performing users' culture. But how do you pick up uh, feedback, uh, diversity? So how do you identify these focus areas and uh, dig deep into uh, getting the data for the people? How do you identify the, the, areas. Uh, the uh, for the business priorities or the data? No. So you know the business priorities yes. mm -hmm. for performance-driven culture, right? Mm -hmm. But there are different aspects of that culture. So how do you pick these aspects and go dig deeper and get these data? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what data you have access to, right? Okay. 
So not everybody has access to the same data, but diversity at AIG is a huge priority. It's top three. So we have started collecting a lot more data on diversity than we did in the past. Um, yeah, even we, we ask uh, actually if people want to opt out of telling us things about them, then of course male, female, we do know. We even have a gender neutral category now uh, to really have people self-identify you know, who they are, but male, female, we, we already have. Uh, but we are also asking things like veteran status, LGBT, uh, you know, disab disabilities, um, health, you know, we're, we're asking a lot of questions to, to really try to su better support these populations. So we're finding the data wherever we can. Uh, we have it in Workday, actually, for the most part. Yeah. So how do you capture this data? During, is, is it during our onboarding process? Or do yes. we have them in? We have some uh, employees who are in since a longer time. Probably we don't have the data of them as mm -hmm. So do we reach out to them again yes. to get the data? Yes, and you say, you send survey, and you say, we want to better support you right, as our employees. And so in order to do that, we need to know more about you. Perfect. If you feel comfortable, please let us know. These, it, literally, it's, it's all of us together. We're all trying to help you right, have a better experience at our company. So it's a survey. But it's a survey giving them the reason why, right? And, and having them support the cause. Could we have the survey as anonymous or it's a, it's a need? I mean, you, it can't be anonymous because then you can't make decisions based on it. I mean, you can, but it would be in the aggregate. And it's really hard when you have anonymous surveys to link that information. So you have to say you're, you are self-disclosing and that this will go into your book. Yeah, so you may not get everybody, but because the cause is to help them in the end, right, the goal is for them, uh, they will be more willing to participate. But that's always an issue, right? Even in, let's say, exit surveys, it's really hard to get people to respond to exit surveys because they really don't care about you anymore. But they do care about you if they're still there, right, and they plan to stay, so you may get their response. But that's the tough thing about surveys, right? Anonymous versus confidential. Uh, confidential is the way to go. You say, I'm keeping your information confidential, I'm keeping your data confidential, uh, then that means it's staying with the people who are analyzing the data and it's not going any further. Your name will not be attached to your individual data. But we do have it, right, in order to make decisions. It's the best way. It's tough. Yes, I see another hand. I just uh, wanted to know, like, of course, any surveys are one way of collecting data. Mm -hmm. And especially and if an employee is giving a survey, you know how, I mean, how the surveys are being given. So apart from surveys, what are other reliable ways to collect the data, which could make a difference, so which could give us real insights about people? Are there any other ways? Yeah. Through so which we can give uh, data which is not, let's say, socially uh, acceptable data, I mean, some real data about themselves and about them. So are there some ways? I mean, I heard that uh, maybe spot surveys are better than you, know, you give them surveys on emails, or let's say you know, uh, pop up on your screen and on your screen and you just go and you know, rate something that's better, you know, yep. because you're not giving responses which are socially acceptable or, you know, which are coming out of certain behavior or certain events. So are there any ways to which you can get this kind of data from people? So we, and I touched on this a little earlier, and I'm going to continue. We do use vendors, and that one of those vendors would, would be LinkedIn to find data from LinkedIn. So there's a lot of data out there on people, um, obviously in the job market. Uh, I'm gonna go into to more of what we, we purchase from LinkedIn. Um, but there's Glassdoor. There's a lot of social media that you can, it's external data, right, that you can buy, or you can just go online and look at it yourself. You may not see exactly who it is, um, and, and you won't, you know, actually for external data, you won't know exactly who it is. It will always be in the aggregate for the most part. Um, but we, we can see behavior and, and trends and information about employee segments uh, externally. But of course, there's, uh, there's so much data about you even internally. What are you clicking on uh, right in, uh, on your intranet? What, what are your interests in terms of, I don't know if you have Yammer, right? Are you, are you contributing to Yammer? Are you clicking on certain topics? Uh, you are you know, LMS systems. What are you, uh, you know, what are you learning? What are you interested in learning about? Uh, what are you putting as your skills in Workday, uh, which is also something that we get from LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn has a, a list of skills. We pull skills even to understand the market. Uh, there, there's that list on that slide that I, I, I put up a little earlier is pretty exhaustive, right? There's more there, uh, but that's pretty much what we are capturing. 
Uh, but there's a lot of data, even things like corporate giving, right? corporate citizenship, uh, we started to look at that data. What do employees who give, right? or what do employees who are in our, um, we have these groups like women and allies groups, or you know, working mothers groups, right? we have a lot of these employee resource groups, we call them, ERGs, I don't know if you have these as well. That provides a lot of data, like who's contributing to these, who's participating, and what does that mean about them? What is their other, are people who are in an ERG, do they stay longer at AIG, right? And, and that's a, then we will encourage more participation, more participation in these ERGs. There's a lot of, the, even combining two pieces of data like this is, is, is creating an insight and actually helps you decide where to spend your money, right? And where to put your dollars and resources. We can talk more about that. All right, so another, this is the LinkedIn part, so good segue. Uh, another thing that, that we do, and this, we have to use some vendors, we, we need some help, um, is really understanding workforce planning using data from LinkedIn. Uh, so LinkedIn has this product called Talent Solutions. Um, I think there's different levels of what you can purchase. There's a lot of other uh, products out there, but LinkedIn is one of these that is, you know, just constantly selling, so I don't mean to sell them, but I just want you to know what's out there because it's really amazing data in a way that we've never seen it before. Just about what the market is looking like. What are your competitors doing in terms of geographies? What skills are in each geography? So this goes back to where am I gonna spend the money, right? Where am I gonna put resources? Uh, LinkedIn really can tell you this. Where are the skills already, right? So they'll look at the skills and they actually don't just look at the skills that you put in LinkedIn, they use implicit and inferred skills. They have a, a, an algorithm that really pulls from your profile uh, that they say is fairly accurate that tells you, know, you as an organization what skill sets are where and where you need to be in terms of real estate to hire these people, right? And where do you need your skills or what skills you need two to three years from now? Okay, two to three years from now, I need to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico because we're gonna have a certain skill set there because of the schools, right, that people are graduating from. I mean, this kind of stuff is pretty amazing. They, they have it in a, in a packaged way that we never had before. Whereas before, we would have to look at job listings and kind of make decisions based on just like eyeballing, okay, what jobs are our competitors putting out there? Uh, this kind of tool does this, you know, in nanoseconds with you know, pulling data from 10 to 20 different sources. So these are the kinds of questions that you can answer. Questions? Are you talking about a specific service from LinkedIn? Yes. Which one? Is talent Solutions. That's actually called Talent Insights. They used to call it Talent Solutions. Oh. They changed the name. Yeah. And they also have Marketing Solutions, Sales Solutions, and they have LinkedIn Learning. But the Talent Solutions or Talent Insights is this. Okay. It's workforce planning. And you can also just buy data on where your people are going, like when they leave your organization, where are they going? That's the data that I'm looking at now. I'm really trying to understand who is pulling the people out of my company, right? What, what, what's the competition doing? Um, and why are they doing that to me, right? What are, what are they offering? Uh, but that, that will help me then make a decision on where I'm gonna invest my next you know, external resource, like how, what, what am I gonna look for? Uh, and I wouldn't know that I, I, otherwise. I, and I, I, mean, I could look myself for hours and hours on LinkedIn to see where people are going. Uh, but this is the kind of information that they give you like that. Yes? Do you also look for a uh, number of people from your company who are looking out, actively looking out through LinkedIn? Yes, they can give you some of that data. I haven't purchased that. Yes, they have that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, right? But they have, they have a, a feature that you can turn off those type of notes as an individual, right? That you can turn off that notification so people can't see, or only certain people can't see. I don't know. There is a lot going on in that LinkedIn talent solution space that I don't understand, but I, I think it's worth it's worth exploring, right? It's, it's data worth having um, in terms of acquisition, right? Acquiring the right talent and where you want to focus your energy. There's, there's data there. Another vendor that we're using now is Vizier. Has anyone heard of Vizier? No, okay. It's been around a while. One it's been around a while. Um, we just bought it last year. It's essentially a visualization tool, but what it does is it intuitively takes you through an analysis. So this means clicking. So I'm clicking through the analysis. I'm filtering data. It gives you almost a data warehouse, uh, and it gives you the ability to give your leaders a self-service tool to do their own analytics. Uh, and the way that Vizier has sold their product. 
um, is by saying, you know, what we have now is our HRIS systems are very operational, and they give us a lot of data. They give us a lot of reporting. And now Workday and, and Success Factors, they're coming out with their own analytics. I think Workday Prism is coming out this year. Uh, and that will probably give us you know, more and better right, data than we had in the past. Uh, but something like a Vizier, we feed our HRIS system into it. And it, in addition, all of our other data, survey data, you know, whatever, whatever we want to give to these people, they will take. This Vizier tool will take. And then it will spit out this analytics without us having to merge our own data in Excel, right, or in Power BI or wherever. Right now, we're actually creating a data warehouse in SQL. Uh, to make it easier to merge all of our data in SQL before it goes busier. But this, you know, this is all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Uh, but busier, we have not rolled out yet. We're still just feeding data. Uh, but I wanted you to know what's on the market uh, because a lot of organizations who don't want to invest in a full analytics team are actually just hiring one or two people and then buying busier, right? Because busier really will do a lot of the analytics work for you. Uh, in addition to being, a, like I said, a self-service tool for your leaders. All right, so I have, I'm closing in the next couple slides with just a couple myths and pitfalls, right? So, is more data better? That's a myth. More data is not really better, like that list that I had in the beginning, that's a ton of data. You can't possibly look at all of that data at one time, right? So those examples that I show, just maybe looking at two pieces of data, two sources side by side, just to see what you need to dig deeper on is the way to start. Um, you don't need a ton of data, although we have a ton of data, um, you don't need it. Is your data perfect? It never is. Even finance data, I have recently found, is not perfect, and finance data actually should be perfect, but it's not. Um, HR data doesn't need to be perfect, and of course, people analytics data doesn't need to be perfect because what we need to do with people analytics data is create insights to make decisions, right? We need direction. We don't need um, precise numbers. It, it would be nice to have, um, but especially things like recruiting, recruiting data is sometimes a mess, right? We just we need to clean it up a little bit, get it into a state where it's usable, and go, right? We can't wait until it's perfect. Blanks, you know, incorrect currencies, you know, let, let's just move, just keep moving so you can start to create insights directionally. All right, can AI do people automatic, you know, people analytics automatically? Um, I wouldn't call busier AI, but busier can do some of this automatically. However, this is the key. When you have that analysis, it's not gonna tell you what to do with it, right? You still need people to tell you to interpret the results and then help you make a decision on what to do with it. That's why we need to partner with the business. You also, and this is also key, need to ask the right questions, right? So what question are you even trying to answer? And that's how you set up the analysis, right? That will then give you the results that you need to create uh, an initiative around. I have a question back there. Yeah. Uh, how do you plan on being relevant? people's level of engagement, so we don't do surveys all that often, we do them quarterly, actually, which is pretty often. Um, within that quarter, we found at Deloitte that people's levels of engagement really didn't change, in the, maybe day to day, right, but overall, if I happen to catch you on a bad day, I caught you on a bad day, but overall, people's engagement levels don't change that quickly. Um, it's really in these kind of three to six month chunks uh, that people do change, right? And if someone is disengaged at, at month one, you better act on it, right? Within the next three months or so, or you could lose that person, right? They become disengaged, and, and obviously their work productivity decreases. Uh, oh, that means I only have a minute left, and I have two more myths. People analytics is just for nerds. That is so not the case. We need, we need nerds, but we also need everybody else, right? This is a multidisciplinary approach. I never can say that word. Um, we need every type of person, the consultant, the analyst, the data scientist, the statistician, right? We need the, the behavioral economics expert. We need so many people um, in this team to make it work. 
The more complex the analysis, the better. It's simple. We need simple analysis. That's what the business will listen for. They will, they will not listen to complex analysis, right? They want simple answers, and that's using simple data. Like I said, just combining a few sources. Pitfalls not involving others. Garbage in, garbage out, right? You want to have some standard of data quality, but like I said before, it doesn't need to be perfect. And I think the last pitfall is not getting started at all, right? You need to get started. <laughs> So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Courtney will have questions from the audience. Yeah, I think I have more time No, we have questions. We I have, have, oh, I'm allowed to do questions now? Yes. yes. OK. Perfect. So this is a fine, insightful session. <laughs> questions here from the audience? Yeah, there are. Do you need a mic? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Itself could be biased, right? It's this what, is true, depending on the it's data. What kind of data you feed? So, how would you take care of that uh, inherent bias of a model being biased? For example, there could be gender bias, yeah. ethnicity bias, because your maturity model will eventually go take you to predictive analytics. Uh, so, it is useful, but it could be a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. So, especially when the model is being used nowadays to predict who gets what kind of sentence even in law enforcement. So how would you treat uh, that kind of ethical question? Mm -hmm. So I think AI and algorithms that are, are you're using for predictions has to be on your own data, right? So we're using our own data to understand scenarios and plan scenarios and that's not biased because I have to make the decision based on my own kind of custom crew of people. Um, if I'm using an outside algorithm uh, or comparing right, to an outside algorithm, that's where the problem is. Right? I, I don't want to benchmark against an industry or a group of people that are inherently biased or, or you know, not representative of my population. So I think we're okay um, doing predictive analytics on ourselves. Uh, as long as we're not comparing, right, and, and we're being careful when we compare, um, because we really need to understand, you know, our own makeup, and, and actually, um, you know, we we are looking for more and more diversity, and that is really hard to find in some of these AI uh, comparative benchmarks that are out there. Uh, so I think that I mean, it's a good point, and I think ethically we need to be aware of it. Recently, there was a study where uh, the models were being trained. More on the male population, for example. Exactly. Yeah. So and in, in the US, it's the white male population. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. And actually, in insurance, that is also a problem. Right? So, so we can balance, right? Maybe we actually do, in some cases, uh, really not take a representative sample of people. When we're doing an analysis, we take a balanced sample of people, right? So we take 10% of every segment. So it's not you know, overly white male. Right. We've, we've done things like that at Deloitte. I, uh, there's so many consultants at Deloitte, but we also have an audit practice and a tax practice. So I don't want to hear about, well, just because there's 40,000 consultants, I don't want them to bias my data. Right? I need to take an equal portion of every business to really understand what the business is telling me, not just one. Thank you. How do you identify when, when uh, two seemingly data points, uh, the correlation between two data points isn't just absurd data? And it's actually a real correlation. How do you say say how one more time? How, how do you establish you, causality? That's okay. So the correlation is fun, right? Because then you see there's some relationship there, and you actually can see the relationship either goes up or down as the other variable goes up or down. Um, but you don't know which way the arrow goes. In order to find that, you have to run a regression. You actually have to have either a PhD or a data scientist or or someone with statistics background, right, run a regression analysis to really see which way that arrow is pointing. And that's a time one to time two study, right? You have to be able to validate that what happened at time one is, or yeah, is causing what's happening at time two. 
but when the data points are less and my data scientist is telling me that the correlation is minus 1 so it's negative mm -hmm. uh -huh. and when again some other occasion is telling me it's plus 1 mm. and uh, you are looking at it and saying it doesn't make qualitative sense so then you need a third person <laughs> to, to give you an answer and actually you need someone to evaluate the different techniques right so why is that person getting such a different response what are the populations uh, are they looking at different populations i mean i think you need to continue like do it again uh, and, you, and you need an objective opinion about that, right? Yeah. So uh, this journey of data analytics, I believe it takes a lot of investment, both from a resourcing as well as the commercial perspective. How do you justify that investment to the business? Mm -hmm. So that uh, you, know, you get a larger buy-in in terms of time to uh, get the results. Because this whole thing will take some time to reap results for you. Yeah, I think there a lot of speakers are going to speak to this better than I can. Because I actually came into uh, AIG with an enormous team that I actually don't know if it's justified why I have so many people. Uh, and so I'm wondering what they're all doing. I'm um, trying to figure that out. But what I've, what I've learned so far, because I've only been there six months, uh, is that they're doing a lot of manual work. Uh, and I think that you know, from the bottom line perspective, it's not what we want. We need more automation and more self-service, more pushing the, the analytics uh, capabilities into the rest of HR. It can't just rest in people analytics, but you do need it, right? So you need a certain investment uh, in order to make better decisions. So there are, are business cases and use cases for it. I think recruiting is one of the, the biggest and best uh, use cases and selling points for people analytics uh, because you can do so much with that data. You just making better decisions on who you bring into this organization is paramount, right? And this is a CEO issue, right? The hiring training, developing, and promoting people is not an HR issue. It's a CEO issue. How is it not, right? Talent is the future. Uh, and like I said before, it's, it, you know, productivity is what's driving our results. So how are we getting our people to be more productive? I, I think it's, to me, right, it's such an easy business case. But I know you know, for, for CEOs, they really have to, and, and all their, their directs, right, um, they really have to understand, and not everybody will, Right, you have to get those champions who get it, um, and those are the people who can evangelize this for you. We'll have one more question. Just yeah. one question. So, the last question I have, and it's more like a philosophical question. So, it's like uh, a lot of times your data analysis leads to very standardized results or very stereotypes about, you know, some population or let's say some age, some gender. And you know, we, uh, this is a, I mean, this is more on this side that now we come to say that every individual is different. And then you talk about data analysis, which leads you to a lot of stereotypes. And leads uh, you to a lot of what? Stereotypes. Okay. Yeah, so how, I mean, and we as HR professionals struggle with this every day, this kind of a debate every day. Can you uh, share? How do you deal with standardizing data? Is that the question? So data leads the insights which come out, they yeah. are mostly standardized, you know, they are, and they also stereotype to a certain extent. Like let's say women, you know, they are, again, you know, one of the reserve it said that women do not get higher ratings, upward ratings. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a stereotype, you know. So a lot of times, and, and then we come to say that every person is different, irrespective of whatever. So how do you deal with that? And this is a daily struggle. How are you dealing with, with the standardization of, or stereotypes, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, so this is where we need to partner with our, our HR strategy leads, right? In it, what we have is diversity and inclusion, right? And understanding how are we moving the needle in these areas? What data are we collecting and how are we developing our people to have this unbiased, broader understanding uh, of what unique skills and strengths people bring to the table. I mean, that has to be a culture shift, don't you think? I mean, it really, we really have to change the way that we think about our people and who we're, we're promoting and how are we, are we developing our future leaders. And what does that need to look like, right, in the next three to five years? It's all about kind of what, what is the workforce looking like, but also in our company, what are, this is a business issue, right, not just HR. What are we going to sell? How are we going to make money in three years? And how is HR going to partner with you to make that happen? Uh, I, I think you know, mitigating these stereotypes is key. Uh, and and uh, hopefully I have, I have somewhat answered your question. I, I know I didn't fully answer. We can keep going. After yeah, I understand it's, it involves more debate. It's, it's a, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a culture shift. I mean, it's yeah. a huge undertaking.
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The question that I have is, uh, I'm sure in your work you have to go out and seek data from the employees. Yes. Uh, have you seen instances where over a period of time the very fact that you are asking for certain kind of data changes people's behavior? Yes. So there. And are, then how do you deal with that? There are leading questions, right? Uh, and we try really hard not to ask leading questions. But just by nature of asking the questions themselves, you are actually defining the culture, right? In some ways, you have to be really careful about how you ask questions um, on surveys, especially, but also how you ask questions in a focus group or an interview. But actually, that's a communication tool. So it, it really is something that you have to be strategic about. How I am communicating to you, even by asking you a question, is sharing the culture with you and shaping the values of the organization. Uh, so I actually don't want to avoid it. I want to use it to my advantage, right? I, I want to ask, a, not necessarily a leading question, but I want to communicate something to you through my questions and what I care about, right, culturally. All right, thank you again. Thank you for it. I can't wait to hear from